The Korg Monopoly is one of my favorite synthesizers. I've had mine since 2009 and I've used it on both my first two albums to such an extent that I decided at some point that now I have to stop using the Monopoly and try to use some other synths as well. <laughs> It has such a unique sound, it can be really aggressive and biting, but still uh, very warm. And it really sounds like something from uh, recordings uh, in the early 80s, uh, which is no surprise because uh, it's a synth from the early 80s. It's kind of a weird structure in a way because it allows you to play polyphonically as well, but then it basically goes into a paraphonic mode. So you still you are still using only one envelope for the VCA and one envelope for the uh, VCF. But you can do quite a lot of interesting things with it. Sadly, the Monopoly was discontinued in the early 80s, uh, only three years or so after its initial release. But now uh, Behringer has made a clone of the Monopoly, so now it's available again. And the big question of course is how does this compare to the original? So let's compare the features of the Behringer Monopoly with that of the original uh, Korg Monopoly. When we look at the front panel, they are really identical. Uh, you have uh, four oscillators feeding into a filter and an amplifier. Uh, you have different uh, separate envelope for the, for the uh, filter and you have a separate envelope for the amplifier. Uh, you have a portamento and you, you have the uh, possibility to detune the oscillators using one, one knob, which is quite uh, convenient. Uh, you have pulse width modulation of uh, the oscillators uh, uh, and you can uh, you can choose a pulse width mod with uh, uh, the with the VCF envelope and you can uh, use it uh, with either uh, the first LFO or the second LFO so that's quite a handy feature of it uh, then it has a couple of effects as well, uh, well effects, <laughs> perhaps not what we think of effects nowadays, uh, but that was the original terminology then. You have oscillator sync, you can switch between single and double. Uh, with single you have a kind of uh, uh, one basic uh, oscillator which is not affected, but the other three are affected. And you switch to double, then you have two oscillators which are not affected by the, by the sync. And then there is also cross modulation. Again, single and double, switchable as well. And you can have both uh, the os oscillator sync and cross modulation. On. And there's an arpeggiator and uh, yeah, a two set of wheels and uh, that's basically it. So, but still for a monophonic synthesizer quite a lot of features. So let's look at the back side. Uh, if you check out the uh, connectors here, we can see the same inputs and outputs that uh, the, the original Monopoly has. However, the arpeggio works differently, or the trigger input is a different type of trigger input than what you have uh, in the original uh, Korg Monopoly, because the original Korg Monopoly took a uh, uh, switch trigger, but uh, the Behringer Monopoly uh, accepts only uh, voltage pulses. And uh, it's, it's more flexible that way because then you can uh, sync it with other uh, gear. The other difference is that you have obviously a set of MIDI inputs and outputs and uh, a USB input as well that accept MIDI. Now the, you can only control the keyboard uh, with, the, with the MIDI through the 
actual MIDI ports or the USB. Uh, so you, you don't have any any uh, control uh, com uh, change command over over the knobs. Uh, which is a pity, of course. I would like to have that, obviously. But uh, the original Monopoly didn't have that option either. So it's perfectly understandable. Now, another thing with the Behringer Monopoly is that it's tiltable. So you can switch, uh, tilt up the panel like this if you want to, to play or program it. Uh, it. It's more convenient that way. And also, uh, the best thing I think about it is that you have. Uh, you can access uh, all the, the small potentiometers inside the small trimmers where you can uh, tune the synth. So that's really handy because in the original Monopoly you had to open up the whole panel and uh, basically have a service manual with you to, to identify which, which trimmers are for, for tuning what oscillator. So this is really handy and uh, that's a really welcome addition to the, to the synth. All in all, uh, it's a surprisingly heavy <laughs> synth. Uh, the original uh, weighs 12 kilo, and this one is not much less. It's like uh, 10 kilos, so <laughs> it's it's quite uh, quite a heavy one. And the uh, reason for this is that uh, it's uh, you have a steel frame, uh, both on the original and on this one, so that brings a, a lot of weight to it. And overall, it's a really uh, like a, a really nice con uh, constructed unit, I think uh, the synths really feel like a, a solid construction and feel like it definitely uh, could take a lot of, of, of roading, so that's really nice, I think. As you probably already noticed, I have in fact two original monopolies. Uh, this is the first one which I got in 2009. This has surprisingly kind of a different character than the other one, which we will come to quite soon. Uh, the other one uh, is uh, my studio monopoly. So I basically call this one my studio monopoly and this one my live monopoly. Because this one I use live and this one only sits in the studio. Okay, so what do they sound like? Well, we have a really good opportunity now to compare the sounds because I, I don't only have one original Korg monopoly, I happen to have two original Korg monopolies. So uh, first up, let's listen to a sawtooth wave coming from my studio monopoly. And let's compare that with the Behringer. And back again. And now let's listen to my live Monopoly. Back to the studio. As you can hear, there's a bit more bass in my live Monopoly than the Behringer. So for the sawtooth in the lower registers, you can hear that uh, the uh, Behringer Monopoly and my studio Korg Monopoly sounds quite similar. Let's see what it sounds like in the upper registers. And then my live Monopoly. live monopoly is quite temperamental it's like uh, uh, it sounds like, it actually sounds like there would be some kind of perhaps portamento glissando effect on because the attack of it, each note uh, sounds like there would be like uh, slurs or something if you listen again so i think this one is definitely in for some service <laughs> <laughs> but, but on the other hand, it adds to the charm because you don't notice in the lower registers at all that there would be anything weird. But when you go up in the higher registers, then you can hear that it's something, something weird going on. Okay, so let's listen to the pulse oscillator on the Monopoly. Uh, the pulse width can be selected and I put it at 50%, uh, which is uh, roughly a square wave. So first up, my studio Monopoly. <laughs> Then 
then the Behringer. Back to the studio. And then for my live. Back to the studio. And back to the live. Again, you can hear the, the funny uh, kind of uh, 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 slurs or, or additional notes in the beginning. That doesn't sound quite clean in the, in the, in the live version. But otherwise, again, I would say that the, uh, the, the, my studio version and the Behringer is, is, is very similar. Okay, let's check out a, a, a pulse width modul modulated oscillator. So I've set the envelope to uh, modulate the, the pulse width in this case. So first up we have the Studio Monopoly. Then the Behringer. Back to the studio. And for my live. So you can hear it's actually more a bigger difference between the the, the live ver uh, my live monopoly and my studio monopoly than there is between the Behringer monopoly and the, the, the my studio monopoly. So uh, this is uh, for me at least was a really interesting uh, to know this how different they can sound. Basically, two monopolies produced in the same years, and uh, still they sound this different just because uh, how the components have aged, basically. And uh, some of them are probably broken down as well in my monopoly, as it sounds like, and would need replacement. Last up, let's listen to the triangle wave. First, on my uh, studio monopoly. <laughs> And then the Behringer. Back to the studio. And then my live. In these old monopolies, uh, you can hear that the that the envelopes, uh, the, the, especially the, the the VCA, I think, uh, aren't so clean. For instance, if we just uh, if we turn down all the oscillators and we listen only to the sound coming from the envelopes opening up. So first on my studio monopoly, then on my live monopoly. And then on the Behringer. Now you can hardly hear the, the Behringer envelopes because they are so clean. Uh, and this, I think, has an effect on the sound because uh, on the, the older ones, uh, you get kind of a little bit more grit into the sound because, uh, as you can hear, the, I mean, the envelopes aren't that clean. Especially in my live one, you can hear, you can have an audible click, or kind of a pop. And, and that's that's clearly that clearly adds a lot to the sound of of, of of the live one. But all in all, I have to say I was really positively surprised about how close the Behringer Monopoly sounds to my own core monopoly, the, at least the one which I use in my studio. So I think that they have succeeded really well in, in getting the sound of the original one. Let's check out the various key assign modes on the Monopoly. Uh, so let's start with the most logical one for me, and that's the unison mode. Uh, that turns the monopoly basically into a monophonic synthesizer. Uh, so you play all the oscillators at once. And then you have uh, the polyphonic uh, mode. 
and that means that uh, you can play the oscillators separately. So it will, when you play it, it will jump, it will jump to different oscillators depending on how uh, how many keys you hold. So if you hold four four keys, then it will play all oscillators. And if you just have like a duophonic, then it will just play like the, the upmost uh, two uh, oscillators. And as you can hear, uh, everything goes through the same uh, one uh, envelope of VCA and filter. So you can select if, if you want the envelope to trigger with every note, or do you want it to play like a or like with a, a Minimoog, for instance. So here is it on single trigger then the filter won't trigger unless I uh, kind of lift all notes. But when I take it on multiple trigger, the filter and envelopes will trigger at uh, each time that I press a note. Then we have a combination of those, and that's the unison slash share. So that means that if I only play monophonic, it will play uh, uh, all oscillators, but as soon as I uh, add notes, then it starts to share them. So let's say if I just play two, then I have two oscillators per note. But if I play up to four, then I only end up with uh, uh, one uh, oscillator per note. It's kind of a strange, <laughs> strange mode, I think. I say, uh, rarely use that. Another one which I rarely use, but uh, it's kind of a fun one, an easy one, is the chord memory. Um, it's really easy to use. You just press a chord, you press the chord memory, and then you have a chord on one note. So you can play. So that's really easy to use. All right, let's check out the arpeggiator at the same time while we're here. So you have like downwards pattern, upwards pattern, up-down pattern, one octave range, two octave range, and full, which means uh, four octaves, basically. Uh, so it's a simple arpeggiator, but you can, uh, with the key assign mode and the arpeggiator, there's a lot of fun to be had. So if we check out the arpeggiator, uh, if we use it in polyphonic mode, then, as you can see, it will go through the oscillators, uh, like uh, cycle through the oscillators. And uh, the fun thing is that you can have uh, different settings for each oscillator. You can have different octaves and you can have different uh, uh, even waveforms. And now if you trigger uh, the, uh, uh, the arpeggiator, if you clock the arpeggiator, because it's possible to clock the arpeggiator with an external signal, uh, now I use a step sequencer to clock it. I have basically a sequencer that puts out pulses right now, it's a 16th note, so I can uh, switch the pulses on and off, and uh, then I can make more rhythmical uh, things, like... And still it cycles through the, the, the uh, uh, different oscillators. So there's a lot of fun to be ha have <laughs> in this way. And uh, yeah, you can, you can have hours go by. And uh, that's the way I came up uh, with the, the uh, intro riff and the main riff for uh, Samba Saturn. So that's basically my old live monopoly that uh, I set up. Uh, I had the same settings for each oscillator setting. I had a pulse with modulator, pulse with, uh, uh, sorry, a pulse oscillator with its pulse with modulated by the envelope. And then I had the arpeggiator, I played a chord, a few chords, and I had the arpeggiator uh, set to, to something simple, like I think it was two more days or something like that, uh, probably up and down. And uh, that way I got the, the, the uh, arpeggio pattern. And I had, uh, I had the arpeggio, uh, arpeggio clock triggered by a 16-4 uh, uh, note, note beat, basically. So let's make a jam by clocking the arpeggiators.
Okay, so another fun thing that you can do is to trigger the keyboard using uh, an external sequencer. Uh, this is easier to show <laughs> than to explain. So uh, I have the unit set up uh, in poly mode. All the oscillators with the same settings. So it's nice to play chords with it. And then I just plug it in and let's see how it starts to work. And then you can start adjusting the oscillators, set different settings on them. And if you want to make this even more complicated, <laughs> then you turn on the arpeggiator, because now I have the arpeggiator clocked to the same clock. Uh, coming uh, or to the same sequencer, the same steps come, the same gates that comes from the step sequencer currently. So let's put it on. And it will be, everything will be in perfect sync, so that's quite nice. As long as I keep playing the keys, the arpeggio will play, but because I only have it on on now, not on latch, as soon as I take away the, the, my fingers, then it stops cycling through the notes. So the arpeggiator stops working, but I, but I can have it on latch as well, and then it will continue to play after I release the keys. So my live monopoly I mainly use for basses and the reason is that uh, live on stage I don't have time to do uh, like many adjustments to the sound. I don't, I cannot start programming a synthesizer from scratch. So I use it only for the bass parts and uh, I, between different songs, some songs I might wish to have key tracking on, otherwise uh, other songs not. Some songs I want a bit more detuned between the oscillators, some songs have a, a fourth oscillator added and some have a bit less release and some have a bit more release and these things I can adjust on the fly. So, so basically it's my main bass suit and I used it for creating uh, the deep blue track and uh, let's see uh, how we can recreate the, the deep blue track with my studio monopoly and uh, with my uh, Behringer monopoly. So first up we need to start with a sawtooth so we have a sawtooth uh, at uh, at the, uh, as the, is the bass octave basically. Let's uh, add some, some cutoff so that we can get some sound. And we need some decay to the, to the envelopes as well. And uh, sustain uh, for the VCA should be something like this. Uh, I noticed when I uh, adjusted the, uh, the envelopes on the Behringer Monopoly that the envelopes uh, uh, behave slightly differently than on my uh, studio Monopoly. Now I haven't made any proper comparison but I got the feeling that I need to have uh, quite more decay and release. Uh, like if, if I compare directly like which numbers I have so then I need to have a bit more decay and a bit more release in order for it to be uh, uh, comparable with uh, my live monopoly and my studio monopoly. Okay but back to the sound. So the second oscillator is uh, a sawtooth as well which I just doubled. And the detuning should be really like quite close to, to precise, but there is of course some, some small detuning involved. And the, the third oscillator is uh, 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 a pulse width modulation. 
So let's see. And it's a pulse width modulation that has, uh, uh, that has, uh, sorry, it's a pulse oscillator that has uh, pulse width modulated with the envelope. So it sounds like this. Ah, sorry, it's the tri triangle. Now we have pulse width. And let's check what, yeah, something like that. Let's add the audio oscillators back. Okay, so after adjusting the sounds a bit more, uh, I have now come as close as possible between the each synth. At least I think it's as close as possible that I can get. So uh, first up, let's listen uh, what it sounds like uh, with the Behringer Monopoly. And then with the Korg Monopoly, with the Studio One. And then let's see what it sounds like with uh, my uh, live Monopoly. So as you can hear, there is quite big differences. And uh, what happens is that all these small nuances that you don't necessarily notice when you compare oscillator by oscillator and, and uh, uh, sweep the filters and stuff like that uh, on single notes, when in a musical context everything adds up, especially when you have multiple oscillators on, and uh, then it gets really like, uh, uh, yeah, the differences just add up basically. Uh, I have some uh, equalization and some compression on, but it's identical for uh, all three synths. And uh, what I think happens is that the, the Monopoly, the live Monopoly, which I originally created the song with, uh, benefits from having these kind of pops in, it at, in its attack, because they kind of really stick out and they make the sound kind of pop out in a, in a, in a positive way in, in, in this particular tune. So there are only a few things that I don't like about the, the new uh, Behringer Monopoly. Um, main thing is the power adapter. It would have been nice to have a built-in power adapter instead of an external one because these are uh, rather flimsy and yeah, it's, uh, you, 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 they can easily get lost uh, in live situations, especially in traveling. Uh, and it might be difficult to find a replacement, although it's probably quite a standard standard, I think. But anyway, uh, I prefer the internal, to have the internal power adapter. It would have made it the unit bigger and more heavier, but yeah, that would have been my preference anyway. And I would have liked to have aftertouch on the keyboard and uh, to be able to, to patch in the aftertouch to control something. Uh, the keyboard now has velocity, it responds to velocity, but you can't assign it to anything on it. So it's only if you use the keyboard as a, a MIDI keyboard, basically, then you can use the velocity. and. Uh, but the main thing that I would like to have changed is how the, the clock signal works. So if you have, uh, the, if you have set the, the unit to respond to an external trigger signal for the clock, then you have to do that using a software and connect the synth to, through a USB cable. So I've done it now and it responds to an external uh, signal right now. But when you remove it, then it completely stops. Uh, on my original Monopoly, uh, if you have it triggered by an external signal and you remove the trigger, then the internal LFO takes over. So it's normally LFO number two, which takes, uh, which handles the clock. And uh, it's the same thing in the Behringer Monopoly, LFO two handles the clock, except if you have set the unit to respond to an external trigger, then it bypasses the, the internal clock. And that would be nice if, if it would uh, kind of uh, like with the original Monopoly that if you remove the external trigger, then the internal LFO would take over. So that is something that I would like to see fixed. Uh, but that's about it. Uh, I must say I'm really impressed with, with the Monopoly uh, and uh, it's, uh, 
it, it really does sound uh, like, uh, uh, I mean, it sounds like a new <laughs> Monopoly, <laughs> not like my old ones, but it really close to them. So it, it definitely feels, feels and sounds like a, a response, like a Monopoly. So yeah, I like it. So thank you very much for watching the video and uh, I'll see you soon.